does not constitute an endorsement by GSK of the speaker's view, personal views and opinions. So thank you and Karibu. Um, Dr. Luch, kindly, um, the meeting is yours. Asante. Thank you very much, Josephine, and that was a very thorough uh, disclaimer. Um, my name is Dr. Joseph Aloj, and I'm the president for the Pan-African Theological Society, and I'm the moderator for the webinar tonight. Uh, this is our third webinar in the series of COVID uh, pandemic in Africa, and we thank GSK for the, uh, sponsoring this particular one today. And we still continue the challenges of uh, COVID-19 pandemic in Africa. And uh, we are going to have uh, three speakers, and I'll introduce them shortly. <clears throat> but in the meantime, we just uh, like to mention a few housekeeping. First, please put your questions in the question uh, and answer session, not in the chat box. Including the chat box, they may not necessarily be uh, 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 appreciated. In the meantime, I like to welcome all participants who are already logged in. I uh, see there are quite a number. Um, we'll ask um, panelists when you are not speaking, to switch off your at this switch of your video and of course your microphone. I like to introduce the topic. Can I have the next slide? <clears throat> First, I already welcome you, and I like welcome all those who are already logged in. And um, our first talk is going to be on uh, testing in Africa. The already challenges of COVID-19 testing in Africa. There's a lot of under testing, or a lot of people are not uh, tested, and test kits may be uh, available, and communicated as well is still uh, a bit of a problem. Next, next slide. Um, and be, before I go to the research, uh, testing sometimes, uh, of course, is necessary for us to uh, plan how to put in the control measures and find out how the control measures are working, and above all, to see what rate of transmission we're having in, uh, in the society. That is going to be addressed by uh, Dr. Amsalo from Ethiopia. And after that, we're going to have a session on research. The research becomes a bit of a challenge in a crisis uh, like COVID-19 at the moment because there's a need that maybe the research may not be a research, I mean, uh, a high priority. But yet you need evidence to continue ma managing a new thing that you're not sure of. And there are a lot of ethical issues that may be involved with research at this stage and, and the need to collect high quality data and this being a global thing, we need a lot of global operation. We'll hear more from Bruce uh, and Ken of this. And lastly, we'll hear from Ivan, who is going to give us his personal experience. All of us are familiar that uh, COVID has touched everybody in the society, one way or the other, the doctors, the patients, the family, there's a lot of issues in personal approach to dealing with uh, COVID patients. The healthcare workers are uh, addressed like people go to the moon. The patient may not be able to tell who is who is looking after him. This gives you a lot of impersonal uh, touch and limits a lot of personal interaction. This gives a lot of mental torture, both to the staff and the patient. But we'll hear about uh, Evan's ex um, experience. So now it gives you an opportunity to introduce um, the Dr. Amsala from Ethiopia to kick off the meeting by talking about uh, challenges of testing COVID V in Africa. Professor Amsala Bekele, over to you. We can't hear. Can everybody hear? Uh, yeah. Are you hearing me now?
Hello. We can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Just uh, my talk is on challenges of COVID-19 testing in Africa. Next slide. This is the outline of my presentation. I will touch on global prevalence of COVID-19 and also what it looks like in Africa and the look also on global standard for testing COVID-19, which is set by WHO, and on what are the challenges in Africa to test COVID-19 in terms of global standards, and also the way forward what we can do in the future. So next, please. So since the start of the epidemic, uh, the epidemic is spread to all over the world. It uh, currently causes a lot of morbidity, mortality, close to more than 3.7 million people are infected, and then it causes more than 260,000 deaths. Almost all continents is involved, and then uh, more than 187 countries are affected with this pandemic. And then it's coming to Africa also. The, in Africa, it's also raising up. So next, please. So when you see coronavirus in Africa, so the first case was reported on February. Uh, 12 from Egypt, but since then, the number increased gradually, and then as of May 7, more than 51,000 cases were confirmed, and it caused also more than 2,000 deaths, and then of which uh, 17,634 uh, patients were recovered. So it's almost involved all the continent, except only country yet not reported a case of uh, coronavirus in Lesotho. Except Lesotho, almost all African countries reported the case of uh, coronavirus of a different level. And then, uh, as you can see the graph, the number is increasing progressively over the last two and a half months. So the four countries uh, more affected include South Africa, Egypt, Morocco, and Algeria. Probably they test more. That's why they pick more cases. I don't think they have a lot of cases. Either. They test more as compared to other countries. Next, please. So generally, the goal of epidemic containment is just to reduce disease transmission by reducing the number of susceptible persons in a population of specific geographical area or reducing the, the reproductive number. So the reproductive numbers may be affected by several factors, like the duration of viral shedding in case of COVID, it may stay between two to four weeks. The infectiousness of the organism is highly infectious and also the contact matrix between infected and also susceptible also. As Africa, we live in common, so the contact matrix is quite high. So there is high risk of dissemination to uh, different people in Africa. Next, please. So the strategy for containment of uh, SARS-CoV-2, we don't have effective vaccine, we don't have effective treatment. The main uh, strategy is to reduce transmission by applying public health measures like social distancing, for physical distancing, hand washing with soap and water uh, for 20 seconds, and or use of uh, alcohol-based hand sanitizer, uh, universal masking, using masks, and also cup hygiene and disinfection of the services, and also proper use of PPE for health professionals uh, dealing with specimen from labs or people infected with COVID uh, 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 virus. Coronavirus. So the other important uh, 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 factor which really helps for reduction of transmission is identification of the cases and then early isolation and then treat those cases and then look for their contact and then quarantine. So testing is very, very fundamental to reduce transmission of the disease and also to know uh, how many people are infected, how far is the spread of this pandemic is going on. So unless we test, we don't know really how far the disease is going. So next, please. So whom we are going to test? So according to our national guideline, which is basically adopted from WHO, we usually test patients who have symptoms and signs of COVID-19, and also person who had contact with those suspected or confirmed cases of COVID-19 within the last 14 days, or history of travel, uh, uh, and then arrival to the country, all those people are quarantined and then tested before discharge to the public. Other uh, indication is high risk, susceptible, asymptomatic individuals are the one we're going to test. Next, please. So when you see 
testing, coronavirus testing in Africa is extremely low as compared to other continents. So only a few countries are doing fine, like South Africa and Ghana are doing better as compared to the rest. So generally, most countries face very low, which ranges less than one per thousand population. I guess, please. So uh, I'm going to say a few words about WHO guideline for testing coronavirus. So WHO developed and dream guideline how to test coronavirus. So starting from sputum uh, collection or specimen collection down to the reporting. So when samples are collected, safety should be really a concern. So one should have to have necessary precaution while collecting sample from suspected patients and the specimens should be packed and then also uh, uh, cold chain should be maintained if a sample is stayed for a long period of time or for a short period of time. So it should be properly packed and then uh, with cold chain transport to the facility where the testing is done. And then the test is done basically in a bio level safety too. So that should be there and then otherwise very difficult to do the test. So the test is done by real-time PCR analyzing the nucleic acid uh, component of the virus, and then finally report the result to the lab. Next, please. Next, please. So to highlight some aspect of WHO guideline, the first one is specimen collection. A specimen may be obtained from upper respiratory specimen or from lower respiratory specimen, particularly for patient who has ambulating nose sputum a specimen may be obtained through nasopharyngeal swab or oropharyngeal swab or wash or aspirate but those patients who can produce sputum you can obtain sample from uh, lower respiratory tract from sputum or endobronchial aspirate or from volan lavage next please and then the test should be done uh, by uh, real time pcr yes amplify uh, the genetic component of the virus. And then the viral gene targeted so far is uh, nucleocapsid protein or envelope protein or spike protein and also RNA-dependent RNA polymerase genes. Those are the ones which is targeted by real-time PCR and then it amplifies and then shows that there is excess please. So uh, when the real-time PCR is positive in a place where there is circulating evidence of circulating COVID-19, a single test is uh, enough to clinch the diagnosis. But sometimes if it is negative, negative cannot rule out. So repeated testing should be done. Patients should be kept in isolation as the test should be repeated because there are several, several causes for negative results. Next, please. So some of the factors which make the test negative is poor quality of specimen. Unless specimen is collected properly, uh, really the quality matters to get positive result. Uh, there is a processing of the sputum in the lab and also when the specimen is also collected later, early phase of the illness, uh, we may get negative result. And also handling of the sputum or the specimen in general may really affect the result. So negative doesn't rule out. So if you have high, uh, high index of suspicion, it's better to keep a patient in isolation and continue repeating the test. Next, please. So serologic tests, up to now, there is no approved serologic test by WHO to test COVID-19. There are some tests coming globally, but currently there is no test which is approved for this purpose. So generally, this is the direction in the future to really to aid investigation of the ongoing outbreaks and also retrospectively analyze the attack rate of this virus. And also it's helpful in case where nucleic acid amplifications are negative. And then the main challenge with this kind of test are process activity. We don't know really what are circulating in Africa. The benign coronaviruses, we don't know. So the main topic is challenges of COVID-19 testing in Africa. What are the challenges? So testing COVID-19 in many African countries, including Ethiopia, has multi-dimensional challenges. The first one is lack of well-trained personnel at various levels, starting from referral lab down to the facility. The other is uh, poor and weak infrastructure, and the logistic constraint, and also regulatory difficulties to pass and have all items in time. And the other is lack of reference lab to assure quality 
and also cultural values. Next, please. So when you see lack of well-trained personnel, we need a well-trained personnel for data collection, sample packing, delivery, and also diagnosis. So lack of adequate training on specimen collection can impact highly the quality of the diagnosis. And also samples should be delivered timely with uh, appropriate temperature. Otherwise, the quality may be compromised or cold chain should be maintained. Otherwise, the result you get may be negative. Next, please. The other is at the lab level, at the diagnosis level. In Africa, generally, we have only limited trained human power on molecular diagnostics. So retraining of existing laboratory professional to this level is not an easy job. It requires resources and also uh, somebody who knows how to do it. So it's not an easy job. And the other is also lack of certified and trained engineers who can annually calibrate and certify the biosafety level required for testing COVID-19. So infrastructure, generally in Africa, reporting is still manual and there is no electronic or web-based data collection. So there is a duplication of effort at the data collection, entry, and also reporting. And then equipment is generally WHO protocol guide us to do the test at the level two. So the number of biosafety level we have in Africa is very limited. So upgrading those labs to the biosafety level two is not an easy job. The other is there is also limited number of PCR, uh, real-time PCR machines in Africa. And then the other challenge is the sensitivity, specificity of those machines in testing coronavirus, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is also a question because of cross reactivity with circulating benign coronavirus. We don't know really in Africa what kind of coronavirus are circulating. And the other is also shortage of protect equipment for health workers, including lab professionals, also another major logistic constraints we had. Next, please. Shortage of consumables and test kits are also a major challenge for Africa. Almost all consumables are obtained from international market under national import permit and regulation, which is a very lengthy process. So really lack of one of the small items may really impair performing the test. So it's not easy to get even minor uh, uh, consumables and also test kits to conduct the test. So most of them come from abroad, so the process is not easy. Next, please. So process of procurement is generally complicated in uh, African countries, uh, most African countries, particularly getting hard currencies, shipment, certification, and also <clears throat> approval from regulatory bodies, and also uh, custom clearance. So this also delay availability of those uh, uh, consumer visions and test key. So in my country, this time shortage of viral transport media, swabs, and then also extraction keys are a major challenge to expand the lab as we expect. Then, as I said, we are using uh, real-time PCR, which is semi-automated and then uh, difficult to run uh, several tests at the time. So that is one of the limitations why, as Africa, we are not doing a lot of tests. The other is the regulatory difficulties. There are regulatory bodies, which are just even though there are easing in the, for this process, but there are, you should have to pass through those regulations. So it's not easy to pass those. So you should have to fulfill and then expedite. So this is also another challenge we had when we really expand those lab facilities. Next, please. Lack of reference laboratory is also another major challenge in Africa because if you don't have reference lab, whether you don't know your quality, whether you are really testing the right uh, virus or not. So really, this is also a major problem. So in some countries, they are referring to other. So the final uh, problem is cultural values. Uh, in general, Africa has uh, low seeking behavior, uh, health leaking behavior, because of lack of understanding of the dynamics of this virus, and also people prefer religious and traditional healing platforms rather than really modern medicine. So this could also limit the number of symptomatic cases to come to health facility and then test it. So that they stay at home and then go to holy water and several places and then they transmit the disease. Thank you. So to share our experience, uh, two months ago, we don't have really lab tests which can detect coronavirus. So we are sending to South Africa since mid-February. Our government start the first 
tests at our national lab. And then now we have uh, 25 testing centers. And then the plan was to test uh, more than 5,000 uh, cases, but still we are just testing less than 2,000. Next, please. So progressively, as you can see, the case in Addis is progressively increasing over the last one month. And then uh, this is also uh, very uh, uh, encouraging. Next, please. So as a country, we are just expanding. The process of expansion is going on. We are using GR's machine. And then up to now, until May 4, we tested uh, more than 24,000, which is extremely low, which is 0.02% of the total population. And then uh, with the current capacity, we can test uh, uh, 6,500. The government is moving to expand more. And then to test, the plan is to test uh, more than 13,000. Uh, in a daytime. Next, please. So samples are collected primarily from facilities with signs, symptoms of pneumonia and patient admitted to ICU, and also from isolation site, from contact tracing, from the community high risk group, and also mandatory quarantine hotels and universities and so on. Next, please. So the way forward as Africa, we have a lot of limitation. We should have to push for more testing and then. African Union and African CDC partnership and launch a new initiative called Partnership to Accelerate COVID-19 Testing, which was launched on February 22 in Addis in the presence of member states. So uh, the name is PACT. PACT is aimed to strengthen capacity to test for COVID-19 across African countries, particularly focusing on those countries which has low capacity to test COVID-19. So the aim is to test more than 10 million in the next six months. Next, please. So packed focus this time in establishment of warehouses and distribution hubs across Africa in partnership with organizations like World Food Program, which has a very good experience, and also Topian Airlines. This model has been used successfully in distributing medical supply and donation from Abiy Ahmed and Jack Ma Foundation initiative to reverse COVID-19 of the Prime Minister of Ethiopia and also found the Alibaba group. So this was used previously and then effectively they distribute the donation. So this platform was used by Africa CDC. So the other focus of PAC is coordination of pooled procurement of diagnostic and other medical commodities for distribution across the continent and also support for deployment or and the training of uh, uh, community health workers to really trace uh, contacts and also standardize and deployment of common technology platforms for Africa and also predict the model for uh, epidemiologic model for Africa and also forecast uh, technically as part of economic recovery and the reopening of uh, 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 the, the activities. The other forward. Uh, way forward, as Africa, we should have to have sound and coordinated governance across the continent. We should have to use also uh, lessons learned from Ebola outbreak. We have experience as African from Ebola, so we should have to use those lessons. And also, we should have to need to, our government should have to really put money on health and particularly on diagnostic. And also, we need coordinated effort of member states. African Union agencies, World Health Organization, and other partners together as synergy rather than really uh, duplicating activities, and also promotion of evidence-based public health practice really encourage. Next, please. The other is also training. So lab personnel should be trained, capacity building should be done at the regional, some regional level, and also coordination of supply and reliances to those labs and then also connect the countries with the manufacturers so that there is a continuous supply and also creation and the management of emergency stockout should be available using the platform which exists uh, through Africa CDC. And then also implementation of internal external quality assurance is very, very important. Otherwise, we don't know what we are doing. And also strengthening of network for next generation sequencing and the biobanking of SARS-CoV-2 across the continent is very, very important because this may come in the future, so we should have to be ready. And that is adoption and rapid validation of point of care diagnostic for COVID-19 is very, very important. And recording reporting of COVID-19 in Africa. And then 
when we to purchase anything is better to put in a bulk otherwise very not easy to get test kit and supply from manufacturers and look also more fun from internal as well as external really to maintain already established labs and also to establish for those countries who not yet established lab the other is a rapid point of care i say for sars cov 2 on existing instruments are very very important to use which are used for TV and HIV should be really translated to coronavirus. So otherwise, really for us, it's very difficult to depend on existing. So thank you very much. Thank you very much <laughs> for excellent presentation, very detailed and very informative. I'm sure we'll have a few questions or uh, comments at the end of it. And I go straight away and ask for Dr. Bruce, uh, 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 Kiranga, uh, who is a researcher and is a student of medicine from Kampala, to take the stage. Are you there, Bruce? Yes, I'm here. Oh, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my uh, topic is to discuss something about uh, embracing medical research in Africa during the COVID-19 era. And I have a couple of slides which I've prepared to help guide the discussion. So as a background, we know that coronavirus outbreak probably started towards the end of 2019, somewhere in China. But the most important thing that has spread to almost all the countries, like Amsal has said, this epidemic or pandemic has touched almost every aspect of normal life. And definitely that means research is not spared. So my um, task this evening is to see how has the epidemic affected the research and what can we do to continue to conduct medical research during the COVID-19 era. But also, I will touch a bit how you can try to set up a corona COVID-19 specific research. We know that clinical care was hand in hand with, with, the, with the research. Research provides answers to questions which improve treatment. Research also brings in compassionate use of medicines. Like now we know actually most of the medicines available for coronavirus are being uh, provided under the, um, the compassionate um, approach. And clinical research also brings the resources, especially in Africa where we, uh, we have limited resources. Some of these trials bring resources which can provide care. So therefore, it is important that we figure out how research can continue during COVID. Uh, initially, we thought that the epidemic was going to be short-lived, but looks like it is going to hang around for some time. So like everyone is trying to see how can business continue, how can tourism continue, how can education continue. I think as a clinicians and clinical researchers, we also need to start to think how can clinical research continue. Otherwise, we won't have solutions to the problems. Next slide. So we, I also want to look at briefly what has been the impact of the COVID-19 epidemic on clinical research. When you look at a database, there's a database called uh, MedData, a database or website. Uh, from this website, you can see that uh, clinical research has already worldwide decreased by 65% since the epidemic started. And that's a huge decline. 
Of course, the different, there are differences by region, but the, what really attracted my attention are the differences by the clinical research areas. For example, you can see uh, respiratory research, according to this database, if you believe in it, is only down by 34%. And I think that is because uh, the respiratory research is at the center of this, this pandemic. But you look at other things, um, they have, like endocrine research has decreased by 80%. Sorry about that. Give me one, one second. Are you all right? We lost you. Uh, with this, you can see, I think the most important point is to see that medical research or clinical research has decreased during the pandemic. There is no data for Africa, but we know that most likely it is more affected. Uh, when you go to the funding land, landscape, the impact on international funding has also been great because, as we know, the pandemic has affected where the source of international research, where it comes from. Next slide. So when you go to look at studies, all medical research at a whole, all of them are affected, but these kind of research have been affected uh, most. Uh, trials where participants are uh, involving vulnerable populations like the elderly people, people with the um, chronic diseases which increase the risk of, 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 of COVID. Trials that require personal visits to the clinic because we know lockdowns and social distancing have not been uh, very kind to these kinds of patients to access uh, research sites. Um, uh, other stage trials, studies which actually people judge that they will not end up into an immediate benefit to the patients have been affected. Trials or studies which are happening in hospitals and not to mention community studies because of the lockdowns, almost all community studies have had to stop. At our site, we personally, we had a, a, a study which was happening looking at uh, lung function in infants and the, 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 the research assistants had to come back and the, the trial had to, to, to stop for some time. Next slide. So the challenges which affect, make medical research difficult and which we need to find solutions are things of mobility and travel. The things which Amsaro has already talked about, issues of the supply chain. Where do you get the, 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 um, the, the trial medications? Where do you get the agents? Because most countries have said, okay, cargo will continue, but actually it is not efficient. Right now we have a clinical trial where we're getting uh, kids from South Africa. They have been to be... Have, it has been halted and you have to make the components of the kit locally. The other issue which comes up with the clinical research in COVID, as we know, we have staff who we have to pay, but now we are burning the resources, but the, the study milestones are not being achieved. There is also the issue of limited staff. It's not yet very apparent in Africa, where most Everything medical is now geared towards corona uh, response, making it difficult to find people to work on research. Of course, slow recruitment, as already mentioned, and the issue of balancing maximum protocol compliance against trying to do some research given the challenges. Patients used to come to the clinic, you consent them, you take on samples, you take off samples, now you do a telephonic follow-up, you can't take off samples. So those things end up into a protocol violations. And as you know, when you accumulate a number of protocol violations, some studies, studies become irrelevant. The other key challenge is, is the monitors. 
As we know, most of the monitoring in Africa has been coming from South Africa, a bit from Kenya. So these people cannot travel anymore, and there's no local capacity to monitor studies. And as you know, with these studies, if they are not monitored, the quality is questionable, even if the conduct of the study continue. Next. So those are the issues, really, which um, I have thought about and which we have faced as uh, a research institute uh, trying to deal with uh, continuing existing medical research uh, in Africa during the, the, the pandemic and trying to initiate research. I also want to touch a little bit about what can we do? Because like I pointed out, like everyone is trying to see how can we continue what we are doing given the circumstances. Mitigation plans, including thinking how you can protect your staff, the, the clinical research staff. One, three things. You must be able to plan to have personal protection for them, not to scavenge from the national resources. Two, managers of projects must now start to think, how do you manage change? People used to sit and patients come to them. Now they have to go to the patients. You used to have four nurses. Now actually you need a quarter of a nurse. So managing that change as a, a PI or a research institute manager has to take the process, communicating to the people, talking to them, um, showing them where the, the things are going. At our institute, we have so far had like three meetings on this, and in the last meeting, we agreed we start to inform people of what the future holds. So it's not a matter of saying, you are four nurses, now I need one, three of you go. The change has to be managed. And that goes to the issue of restricting non-essential staff. If someone is not having an activity, probably they shouldn't come to the research clinic. Then there are issues of building confidence in your patients that they will be safe when they come for research. One of the, excuse me, one of the uh, strategies is to do virtual meetings. I mean virtual consultations as, as far as possible. Call the patients, the ones who have WhatsApp, talk to them on WhatsApp and send them the information. There is another thing which is very interesting. Being authentic, while you are synthetic. This is something that we always know, we have always known that it's important. Should every medical research have a control group? But we already have historical control groups, we have data. So maybe in this pandemic, we can design studies which concentrate on the active group and see if we can find synthetic uh, control groups. Um, the other thing which we think can be a good modification plan is that when you assess how you are going to deal with each of the research projects, go project by project, don't do omnibus decisions. But you can also simplify protocols. Some trials designed before the pandemic were actually too complicated. And you wonder whether all the things we are doing, we need them. So during this epidemic, probably we need to analyze those protocols and see how we can save the most important of the study. But the most important thing, check out and follow regulatory guidance on how to conduct research during the pandemic. In the next slide, you can actually see that m most countries have put up something. You can see two of them from Uganda. Our National Council for Science and Technology pushed out something at the beginning of the epidemic here. And they said, no recruitment of new patients since trials. Of course, we are now discussing that. How long shall we continue? Do a home follow-up, if possible, don't bring people to the clinic. The National Drug Authority of the country also followed. But down there, you can see the FDA has also pushed out something, how to conduct research during the corona pandemic. And that document, I think everyone should read it. For them, there are more details. They give you options on what you can do 
to preserve some research going on. Next slide. Ah, okay. So my last discussion is going to be on how can you set up some COVID-related research? We know that the COVID field is a fast-moving target. Before your concept, you think of something, write it down. Before the ink has dried, a publication has been pushed out on the same idea. And this has been made worse by the pre-review publications. <clears throat> I'm sure people have seen this. Is it Medrixi, that website? Write something, put it in PDF, throw it there. So one thing is you need to move very fast with your ideas and consult widely in order to be able to have some meaningful research program during uh, the, the COVID time. The second issue to think about while you look for COVID research, funding is limited. The international funding uh, is not coming through as it should have come. And because the problem is generalized. So, so my advice is to target local funding, but I think we also need to start to learn to work with small budgets because our countries and, and funding mechanisms cannot give big grants, but we still have to get answers to our problems. The regulatory clearance is slow. However, in some countries like in Uganda, there is emergency research provision where you can actually start research and then notify the ethics body and the regulatory bodies. So look into your uh, guidelines and see if you can pick such sections such that the process of writing the protocol, cleaning it up, taking it to IRB, getting the views, by the time you finish, the issue has moved on. And we have experienced this uh, in, our, um, in our country. For example, we, in our research group, which I will show you shortly, we had groups which were making apps. Say, no, we are going to make an app to go and screen people in the airport. Before you finish the app, the airport is closed. We are going to go and test this group. Before you finish, something has changed. So you need to really be fast. The other issue to consider is that, especially in Uganda and Africa, where cases are not many, is that there are many research groups interested in the same patients. So consider joint protocols consider collaborations, but please sign documents, agreements, so that people don't change their mind along the way, because this happens a lot in Africa, and you find yourself a crime. There are also state restrictions in, in emergencies. Some information may not be allowed to you, you to access it or to use it or to publish it. So as you seek uh, regulatory clearance, please also seek administrative clearance from the Minister of Health and other bodies so you don't get frustrated. And candidate drugs used in COVID have not yet arrived in Africa, but as Africans, we need to push to see that we can be included on the list of the compassionate to use doses as far as we can. Next slide. So, to show you that the COVID research is a moving target. I went to PubMed uh, yesterday. You can see already, if you just put COVID, there are already about 10,000 articles which are coming out. Of course, 110 from Africa. I tried to peruse them. Most of them are perspectives, no original research for Africa. So we really need to see how we can do some research on COVID in Africa. Next slide. And lastly, we have formed that research group, Covedres Uganda, to try to address the things I talk about such that we work as a group, we leverage the resources. If someone has already asked people their age, don't use your money to pay an assistant to go and ask the age because the money is not there. Collaborate with them, you share, and we have been able to conduct uh, a couple of studies. We have conducted a study on profiling the patients and their outcomes. Uh, that will be publishing soon. We have conducted a study of establishing a biobank. We are collaborating with young people to develop apps for contact tracing and for advising people's movements. We are 
doing psychiatric studies on PTSD, and very soon we are going to launch a trial of convalescent plasma. All this working with little money and working in groups and volunteers. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bruce. That was excellent and very, very challenging. And we look forward uh, to some of your research findings in future. Uh, we will you um, Now, can we move the last of the speakers tonight, Dr. Ivan Schwartz, from who is going to tell us what he did not intend to say? That are the unintended consequences of COVID. Ivan, next overview. Uh, good evening, and thank you for this opportunity. Next slide. Next slide. I'm, I'm a doctor, not an economist. No, sorry, one back. Um, that's fine. So I'm, I'm, I'm not an economist, I'm, but I am a doctor. But I read a lot of history, and that's what made me start thinking about what was happening now and what we could learn from history. Next slide. And the most important thing we can learn from history is that we don't learn from history. Next slide. And at the beginning of the, next slide, at the beginning of the uh, pandemic, a, a patient arriving from overseas got off the plane, found his GP and said, doctor, I've got a little bit of a cough and a little bit of chest pain. The doctor said, go to the laboratory, have a COVID screen, and then come and see me. The following day, the patient had a massive pulmonary embolus and died. Now, this is not considered a COVID death, but I would say this is a COVID death. So I'm going to speak briefly on the health consequences, the economic and the social consequences. Next slide. So starting with health. Next slide. Okay, we'll start with a little bit of history. The Ebola pandemic swept through West Africa between 2014 and 2016, resulting in some 11,000 deaths. Next slide. But at the same time, the, the epidemic scared the patients, and particularly the women and children, from going to healthcare facilities. Vaccination campaigns were in trouble, as were many diseases, and in particular malaria, HIV, AIDS, and tuberculosis. And these are major, major problems in Africa. Next slide. So what did we see? We saw an increased death rate in malaria, TB, and HIV specifically, but also in many other uh, conditions, and very soon, there were more deaths unrelated to the Ebola than to the, um, uh, from these other diseases. Next slide. In fact, that for every Ebola slide, for every Ebola, there was a one death from TB, AIDS, or malaria. What about high, high blood pressure? Next slide. Uncontrolled blood pressure will cause strokes, heart attacks, kidney failure. Um, next slide. So what about diabetes? Diabetes, as we know, causes vascular disease, kidney disease, diabetic neuropathies, uh, eye problems, uh, major pregnancy complications. Next slide. Um, and and w this addresses the early detection. We've screened for TB constantly. So what do we want to do? We want to prevent disease. But if we miss the early prevention, we want to pick up disease before it becomes a major problem and in some cases becomes untreatable. 
specifically pulmonary tuberculosis. Uh, South Africa, certainly, we've decreased the incidence as it was 30 or 40 years ago, but it still is a major, major problem, specifically with the association of HIV. Next slide. So the Africa specifically has many diseases that you won't see in the European or more first world countries of the world. Next slide. So these are the screening that we do all the time and very, very important in Africa. Uh, specifically tuberculosis, but so many other diseases. Diabetes, almost a pandemic in the Western Cape of South Africa. Uh, but blood pressure problems, also a major, major problem in Africa. Next slide. Ischemic heart disease, but uh, South Af uh, Africa um, more than myopathies as well. So the public right now are avoiding healthcare facilities because of the fear of corona. Not only that, but the hospitals are making access to the hospitals more difficult. They are stopping uh, visits from um, the patient's family. Uh, so patients don't want to come to, to hospital. Cancer doesn't stop because you've got a pandemic. But the treatment of cancer has been delayed. Uh, uh, diagnosis, screening has been delayed. Uh, treatment has been delayed with result of an increased mortality. Next slide. England have done some studies. And they estimate that in the next 12 uh, months, there will be up to 18,000 extra deaths just from cancer newly diagnosed cancer patients who haven't been diagnosed or treated early enough. Next slide. So these are all unforeseen consequences of, uh, of the uh, uh, corona pandemic. The, the, eco the economic value of vaccination can't be underestimated. And a study done internationally put this figure at 820 billion in the last 20 years. It's massive. And you'll see how the economy and health are interrelated. Next slide. So uh, these are African diseases, Af Af African in uh, infections that if we neglect them, these will have massive, next slide, massive economic uh, effects. Next slide. But while we're talking about pandemic, smoking and obesity are by far major pandemics that we really just plain ignore. Uh, in the States, for instance, they estimate almost half a million deaths just from smoking. Next slide, please. So, next slide. So, we come to the economic aspects. World Health Organization, they have stated that poverty kills more than disease. And one of the banks here in South Africa have forecast that the South African GDP will contract by up to 23% in the next quarter. Massive, massive uh, effect on the, our economy. Next slide. So look at this, the death rate of poverty. We already touched on this. Malaria, HIV, tuberculosis, other tropical disease, they're in the millions every year. Next slide. These are figures from 2010. Daily deaths. Approximately 35,000 deaths daily from these diseases. And you will see that these are all diseases that are very treatable if you've got the facilities. Next slide. Looking at the death from uh, specific countries, and you will see that 
the the black spikes are in this slide that's Uganda and Nigeria, but this uh, mimics the rest of Africa. Africa has major major diseases from uh, infections, diseases that are very treatable if you've got the money and the facilities to treat it. Next slide. So, six million deaths globally from very treatable diseases, but diseases that are very prevalent in Africa. Next slide. And these diseases, their roots are in poverty. Poverty increases your chance of getting ill. But the harsh reality is that putting your health at risk may be the only way to survive or keep your family safe. Next slide. So contributing factors, and you will see that these are all associated with a poor economy. The contaminated water, inadequate sanitation, education, nutrition, housing, overcrowding, work conditions, lack of access to health services, neglected diseases, health education. Next slide. So the cycle of poverty, the poor are more associated with disease. And I've just put up this slide to show if this is in the United States where there's a food insecurity in such a high percentage of people, what is it like in Africa, especially with the economy becoming worse? Next slide. All African diseases, but we also have asthma, cardiovascular disease, and obstetrics, a major, major problem. Next slide. Okay, poverty increases your chance of getting ill. Next slide. When poverty is reduced and eliminated, health outcomes improve. Wealth creation is a means to improve your health. And we mustn't forget this in the pandemic that we are now going through and the effect it is having on our economy. If we are able to get rid of poverty, we will improve the health of our people. Next slide. So is corona death, is it a corona death versus the economy? That's what our politicians would like to tell us. I would say it's death from corona versus death from poverty. Next slide. And this is what the World Bank have forecast. Major, major effect on sub-Saharan Africa on our economy. Next slide. So just as a matter of interest, if you look at Africa, Africa is most impacted by infections, tropical diseases. Next slide. But let's look at the effect of the coronavirus. Africa seems to be spared from the major impact. And major, maybe we should be handling our uh, effect on our uh, pandemic differently to the rest of the world. Now, lastly, the social impact. Everybody is impacted. Next slide. Specifically, older people, they have chronic health, they are uh, more at danger of uh, the pandemic, and they're certainly less able to care for themselves. Next slide. The second group of people would be the disabled. They've got ma major challenges, lack of, ability, uh, of availability for healthcare facilities, accessibility, often affordability, and the problem of stigma and discrimination. Next slide. But there's also all of us with lockdown have the problems of anxiety, depression, 
There is an increase in suicide, especially in the elderly. Unwanted pregnancy of the young girls who have got nothing else to do. Um, education is impacted and we could have an effect on our uh, tertiary education in the years to come. Divorce rate, if the partner that you're with is uh, possibly uh, a problem. Gender-based violence. The first week of the lockdown here in South Africa, there were 87,000 calls uh, uh, to the police uh, um, as far as gender-based violence is concerned. There will be some child abuse, unfortunately. Homicide. Well, this can be balanced against the decrease in homicide because people are not allowed outdoors, but uh, there will be some increased um, uh, homicide as well. So these are my personal recommendations. We, face masks should be worn in public, and this was emphasized by Heather Zarr in the previous talk. Frequent hand sanitation. Um, strict hospital attention to infection control. The elderly and those with added comorbidities should take extra care and maybe they should be uh, confined, but certainly not everybody in my opinion. I would suggest we should open our schools and our other education facilities. And very important, I would say we should open the economy to limit the effect on poverty in Africa. Next slide. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Eva. Uh, excellent presentation. I hope uh, Trump listened to you because he would have liked it very much because he wants to open up the economy. I think you raised some very practical issues, which I always see on the television. Uh, many parts of Africa. The residents are rather saying that they'd rather die of COVID than die of hunger, or rather they'd rather have been infected with the COVID, which they have 60% chances of not dying, or I mean, or healing themselves, than uh, be hungry and then they share death. It's very really difficult, you know, and I'm surprised there's high divorces, but I thought now that the couple are more together, the wife must be happy that they have a lot of with them. So maybe they, they like it in the opposite way. But anyway, that's a talk for another day, maybe the discussion. Now, um, Enoch, I have not seen any questions. We have no discussion now. Enoch, are you hearing me? Josephine, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Uh, I think yeah. I've seen one question. Huh? There had been a question. From... Uh, I can't see them yes. on my screen. Maybe you can uh, you can ask them on my because I can't see them on my screen. Okay. Um, let me see. Um, I think Jennifer had. Oh, sorry. With all the challenges uh, facing clinical research, best can African researchers provide? rapid evidence to support policy on COVID management from existing information already published by researchers from the West who had the pandemic earlier. Well, Bruce, would you like to comment on that? Can you repeat that for me? I seem to miss some parts. Sorry, so with all the challenges facing clinical research, how best can African researchers provide rapid evidence to support policy on COVID management from existing information already published by the researchers from the West who had the pandemic earlier? Okay, thank you. That's actually exactly what we are doing. We look at how what they are doing elsewhere and try to, to do it here. However, uh, still we need to generate some local evidence to spice up what is happening elsewhere uh, because uh, the, 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 the epidemic is, a, is, is different and the way the patients are responding is different. So uh, the, 
the short answer is yes. Let's not reinvent the wheel, what people have seen elsewhere we use. But despite the challenges I went through, let's really put in as much effort as possible to see that we can generate some local evidence. Thank you, uh, Bruce. Uh, Amsalu, are you there? Amsalu? Yes, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, can you just tell me, what do you do with your positive cases that you found on testing who are asymptomatic? Thank you very much. So our guideline is uh, we usually test high-risk group like elderly and also those who have uh, contact with the population like drivers and also health professionals, even though they are asymptomatic, there is high risk those group are maybe infected and that they carry the virus and then transmit to the others. So we test and then if they are infected and if you confirm, uh, we, we quarantine them, we isolate them and then keep them. So we don't test all asymptomatic ones. The only asymptomatic one which is tested is only those who are at high risk, we believe, we identified groups leveled as high risk, as I said, elderly, and also drivers, and also hand professionals, and those are the really the ones which are uh, tested. And then we found also some positive results from this group. And then are, but now uh, that we know that now that we know that half of the infectious cases are asymptomatic. Yeah. Now you don't test the asymptomatic, and you missing some. Yeah, definitely we are missing, definitely, because the issue is that the, the test kit we have, the capacity we test all asymptomatic, so we don't do all because we are prioritizing most of the cases on the facility, the symptomatic patients, and also those who is in quarantine, and also those uh, with contact, and uh, only we are targeting asymptomatic high group, because really is very difficult to test everybody and then with the current logistic and then the test, test capacity really very difficult to do all asymptomatic cases so the next move is just to expand more and then uh, to test every patient visiting hospitals inpatient outpatient uh, at private and also government not only limited to those came with respiratory problems so the next move is test every admitted patient with any kind of illness and also look their contact, they have uh, really symptoms, and then also test their positive. In which or what institutions do you quarantine them? Their homes, hospitals, or some institutions? So this 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 time we are using universities. All schools are closed, and so the government is using all universities and the schools turn to be quarantine side. So that's where we are keeping all those. Uh, uh, contact and also uh, suspected individuals. All returnees from uh, abroad are kept at the uh, facilities in the universities and then schools. Who pays for their upkeep? Uh, those who can afford, those who can afford, they can stay at hotel, they can afford themselves, but if they cannot afford, the government is the one who cover all costs of uh, quarantine. Okay, thank you. Uh, Joseph, any other questions? Yes, there are a couple of questions, but I'd like to state if someone wants to ask a question, um, there's a symbol for raising hand. Um, once you raise your hand, um, Enoch will be able to be a You will be able to unmute you, and then you can, um, they can ask the question. So there are two questions here. So the first one. Um, can we say our low income status in Africa kept our immune systems on toes, thus lower death rate? And the other one, um, what are possible protective factors that will sort of justify us opening schools and economies? Because if we rely on other countries, then we would not have much in the way of evidence to support this. So I think we can take those two. Okay, Dr. Msalo, over to you. Thank you. So for me, uh, really, Africans don't have really 
uh, different immunity against this virus because this virus is a nice virus. We don't have immunity against this virus. So the only thing I can say is there are also debates, but the only thing I can say is the introduction of this virus to Africa is late as compared to other continents. So the first epicenter is China, and the second is Europe, the third is America. Probably what I'm thinking, well, I guess it's just the fourth epicenter is probably Africa. So the late introduction, the capacity of our testing matters rather than really we are immune against COVID. Uh, I'm not sure whether we are immune because this virus is nigh for everybody. We are not really immune. That's my answer. And the other is the balancing is very, very important for the next question. And if at least say something, because uh, if you run and open the economy, probably that is also a challenge for us. The dissemination of the disease may be another challenge. So balancing both is very, very important. In Topia, we didn't close. 100%. So uh, we are just applying the public health measures and also screening uh, more patients. Uh, we are improving in terms of the screening. And then to some extent, and also some activities are also going on. We didn't shut down everything. So uh, staff who can work from home, they are working from home. There are staff who should have to go and then work. Otherwise, if the economy remain down, that's also a big, a big challenge for Africa. So balancing both are very, very important, which is a very delicate issue actually. So the economists want the economy to come up, but as a physician, for us, if this epidemic go beyond control, we cannot really control. So it's very difficult. We should have to really cautious at this time. We don't really recommend opening of uh, all uh, facilities based on what is done in the West. It is a very delicate, but <laughs> between lock the economy and the control of uh, COVID. And I don't think there's obvious a solution. I think it needs a lot of common sense and thinking. Science may not necessarily give you uh, all these uh, computer projections of the chain of event uh, are just figures, but maybe difficult. But at the end of the day, economy must be reignited um, if people survive, because as they say clearly that even if health is not everything, Everything is nothing without health. So even if you've got, I mean, well-boosted economy and you're not sick, you're not enjoying So I think we must get a balance where we, we have economy, but at the same time we have healthy people to enjoy that economy. So uh, uh, it's a delicate balance. But Dr. Amsalu, if you see the studies from America, these are blacks that are dying more than the whites. I mean, in one state, blacks constitute uh, 20% uh, of the population, and they, yet they constitute 32% of the deaths from COVID. So they can't be very resistant. Uh, I let those blacks are a little different from the one in Africa. Uh, thank you. This is really some of the issue nowadays globally becoming an issue. So a lot of blacks that died in the U.S. So the issue is poverty is really the main issue even in black in the U.S. So most of the black in the U.S. is deprived of health care and then they have no insurance. Their uh, uh, care is also, their uh, uh, comorbid conditions are also not well controlled. They are diabetic, obese. And those are really the factors which really ultimately determine the outcome of the COVID-19 illness rather than really race. I don't know, I don't have really uh, direct answer for this, but what I read and then what I quote from our colleagues in the US is just basically those people have poor health. So their uh, economy is poor and then they don't have insurance, they don't have really well-controlled hypertension, well-controlled diabetes, they have a lot of medical problems. So when they acquire COVID, the mortality is quite high in those group of uh, individuals, rather than really genetic. So uh, for me, we are still not immune. I don't really consider Africans living in Africa are immune against COVID-19. I'm not sure that. So it's not yet really proven. So I'm believing that the epidemic is starting. And then some of the intervention we are doing is helping us because we uh, get a lot of time to do some intervention, unlike other um, continents like Europe, America, so Africa uh, got ample time to prepare and to do some interventions. So those interventions help us and then probably 
That is why we are at least okay at this time, as we are not overplayed to his, all those uh, cases, severe cases. And then uh, uh, we are sure uh, this may continue unless we really work for the preventive aspect. We may be flooded. So make sure that we should still open our eyes and then continue the preventive measures. That is the major, uh, uh, really, uh, major activity we should have to do as Africans. So, the right answer is probably they have comorbid conditions which is not controlled. That may put them to die rather than the, the genetic. I don't know. That may be investigated. So this is a really big issue. Thank you. So this blacks are already on the on the death slope. Kobe just give them a little push and then they die. So they can't yeah, believe. That's, a, that's why that's what I got. <laughs> yeah, that's what I got. That's what my colleagues and those what I read. Almost. But this yeah. needs also investigation anyway. Because we don't know Bruce. much about COVID. Dr. Bruce, are you there? Is Bruce around? Uh, is, is I'm, I'm here. Yes, like institution like this where you have no experience and you have no time getting results is a, is a, an agency. You don't want to do a, say, a five year trial before you get so called evidence based uh, uh, medicine. Uh, what would you, do you approach? I mean, it's kind of. Uh, treating the patient with uh, even we have a lot of herbs being produced in Africa. Uh, how do you feel that we should test that herb before we really export it uh, to other parts of the world? Because there's not, there's not much time to refine it and uh, and uh, what what would be the idea of this uh, uh, this big uh, hub hall which is being a Use in Africa. How would you uh, like us to approach it to see whether it's, uh, it's worth it or not? Yeah, that, that's a very difficult, very, very difficult question. Uh, uh, but, but, but what I can say is, as a doctor, uh, at least for Uganda, and I know Kenya and the two other places. We are not given chance to study a lot about alternative medicine, our curriculums. So that actually makes us incompetent to comment on these alternative approaches for, for treating diseases. So, uh, incompetent as I am, I would think that people who think they have herbs which could help could be allowed to try them mm -hmm. in a disease where we are experiencing a bit of futility, especially in Africa with not very many treatments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think let me make my answer short. I, I mean, how, how, how do you think this uh, herbal trial was done in Madagascar to get such results so quickly? And, uh, and 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 pack it ready for export for treatment. I mean, did you analyze the way they conducted the research, if at all? Um, like like I said, probably in alternative medicine the pathway may be different. Mm -hmm. But if we follow the pathway of modern medicine, mm -hmm. probably it is too short. Mm -hmm. Uh, for them to have put this onto the into the clinic, mm -hmm. um, there's a professor who is interested in alternative medicine <laughs> at our university. Okay. And one of the things this person keeps saying is, when you are using herbs, we are actually not using chemicals. We are using the herb itself. So it's a different area, but mm -hmm. one thing which we need to to do is. Even if, this, and this is my personal opinion, I shouldn't be quoted or something. My personal opinion is, even if a herb is going to be as useless as eating a popo, it should not have any harm. That is what I'm saying. So okay. you can take it very fast, but if it is going to cause any harm, or if you have not assessed it safely, then don't use it. But if it is completely useless, and then it is harm, harmless, then you can try it. Oh. That is what I'm thinking. 
Okay, just as in, any more questions? There's a, hello, there's a question um, directed to Dr. Bruce. Um, funding will most likely go to COVID-19. Are you making efforts to collaborate in COVID-19 research? That was for, specifically for Dr. Bruce. Can you repeat it? Um, funding, uh, the person is asking, funding will most likely go to COVID-19. Are you making efforts to collaborate in COVID-19 research? Okay. Yeah. The, the question is actually not very clear to me, but let me try to see if I can make some answer. Uh, collaboration is key. Like I said in my presentation, the, the, the resources are small uh, from our governments and uh, in-country funders. So we need to collaborate to maximize uh, outputs. Uh, I think this person is asking, maybe most of the money is going into the response itself. How can we as researchers ride on to the response? And yes. I think that's a very, very genius question. Um, we need to see as researchers how can we ride on to the response to conduct some research, not research per se for the set of answers, but you go along with the other people. I think we should try it if they allow. But you know most people really think you go as a researcher, you are just going to waste their time. You find they have a form which has, has eight questions, they have filled two and skipped two. And then for you, you are saying, no, we have to make sure it is all filled. You can actually slow down people. But I think, like I said on the protocols, probably all the things we have been taught in, in school on how to do medical research, we need to evaluate them. Do we really need all of them? And this is actually the issue of the hubs. Do you really need to go through all those stages? So we need to think, probably the pandemic is going to bring new ways of how people will earn money, but it should also bring new ways on how medical research should be conducted. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, so there is another question by Gloria. The testing kits have issues with false positives on, or negatives. Is there any institution working on this? despite the challenges for marginalized resources? Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes, I'm sorry, are you there? I'm there. Okay. It's not what I The question of false positives and false negatives. Yeah, yeah. So the test gives you false positive or false negative. Particularly false negatives are if the patient is symptomatic, test should be repeated. So validation of those tests are very, very important. In Africa, one of the things we lack is validation of those tests. This is then usually in reference labs. So if a country has reference lab, those are the ones which look those validation tests. So validation tests should be done. And then initially what we did was, in, in our country was, we were sending our samples to South Africa to validate our tests, and then subsequently we developed a capacity to do so. What the country should have to do with this kind of uh, validation test. Otherwise, it's very difficult to rely on existing uh, test results only, positive or negative, because we don't know what is existing in Africa before. There may be benign circulating coronaviruses which doesn't give you serious illness like the COVID-19 one. So we should have to really value further sequencing of the existing virus, whether this is a real virus causing COVID-19, should be really done at the reference labs and should be also referred to other countries. So that is how this time Africa is establishing reference lab where validation of those uh, labs are uh, done. So through African CDC, you can contact African CDCs are producing uh, this kind of lab in different parts of Africa to validate the uh, in-country lab involved in testing uh, COVID-19. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, there's a question by Emily. Should people with respiratory problems be much worried during this period? What do you advise employees who have chronic illnesses and still going to work? So they should have to be taken, yes, they should have to be worried, particularly uncontrolled respiratory conditions like uncontrolled asthma, uncontrolled COPD, uncontrolled bronchopathy, uncontrolled ILT, yes, they should have to be worried. So the first thing is their respiratory condition should be controlled. They should have to take maximum precaution, they should have to have uh, maximum precaution. Preferably, they should have to avoid going if possible. So we usually make off those high-risk groups like old age, patients with comorbid conditions for the government of Ethiopia of most of those uh, individuals and then they work from home. So preferably it's better to really uh, stay at home if possible. But when they go out, they should have to wash their hands, they should have to keep their distance from anybody and then they should have to wear masks. So those are the things they should have to do. Maximum precaution should be done. There's are already at risk, definitely. Basically, um, <laughs> this respiratory conditions do not put you at higher risk of getting COVID, is, but is that if you get a COVID infection, then the disease may be more severe. That is the main problem. Yeah, thank you. There is a question by Gloria. How are we focusing on prevention as that will reduce or curb the diseases we have? Okay. Sorry, let me repeat. How are we focusing on prevention as that will reduce or curb the diseases? We have people using cloth masks due to affordability issues. Will this not make the situation worse as we are still in the midst of this pandemic? No, I think so we had a very, okay. we had a very good talk uh, last week about the mask and uh, those cloth masks have been found very useful. Now, when you wear a mask, the important thing is that it stops you from infecting other people. It does not necessarily stop you from getting the infection. So you still have to keep the distance and observe the other hygiene. But it certainly reduces the amount of droplets you produce when you talk, when you laugh, or um, when you cough or sneeze. So they, they are useful, whether they're made of clothes. And it's been shown that the Achialim, those are made, all made uh, are equally useful and protective. So, so you should not fear. It's not like to make anything else. It can only improve things. But I'm sorry, do you have anything to add? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is what you say. So, is that important? And even though they are homemade, they protect from uh, really transmitting to others. So, additionally, people should have to really keep their distance, wash their hands regularly, or use hand sanitizers. So, if you apply all those things, this universal masking, not only somebody is going doing, but everybody should have to do the mask, his mask. Otherwise, if somebody is doing, others are not doing, that's not good. So if you universally apply it, all those homemade masks work also. They protect from transmission to others. Just we've got one minute to the end. Yes. Um, any, any question? So there was one question, although I've seen Ivan has answered it on chat, so maybe mm -hmm. for the benefit of others. Um, thanks for all the presentations, that's by Samuel, on recommendations for schools and economy, shed more light on this recommendation. Um, Ivan had responded on chat, so I don't know whether he's still online, if he would like to give the response to the, you know. Uh, the, the point I made is that you have to balance the economy with the preventing spread of the coronavirus. Children, and we talk about the schools, the, the, the effect on children is much less severe than on adults. And in fact, the main problem uh, are the effect the children would have on their grandparents, or possibly the elderly uh, teachers who may be uh, in the school. But if you don't teach the kids, and if you're in a private school, that's great. Uh, there's lots of Zoom meetings. But if you're in a government school, you are losing many months of schooling, which will affect you uh, if you're in matric this year. So uh, you have to look, I think, in the long term. Pandemics in the past have shown that it affects the economy for many, many years. 
You need to get the economy back working. So very, very important. I would get the schools back. Use face masks because it has been shown to make a difference. Teach the kids how to wash their hands on a regular basis. And we've seen people, you go to a toilet and they come out and they don't wash their hands. Teach good hygiene to the kids. It will make a difference, not only for COVID, but for every other infection. And that is something that we have seen. We have seen a decrease with the lockdown in other infections, ear, uh, tonsils, even appendicitis have been shown worldwide that the incidents have decreased. So good hygiene will make a difference long term. And I think that's the one of the lessons that we've learned from this pandemic is what good hygiene will affect for everything else. So um, I would I would say use the preventative measures. If you are elderly and you're worried, okay, maybe stay at home. But if you're elderly, you're less likely to have an effect on the economy. The workers need to get back to work to stop all the other downside of a poor economy. So that's that's my two two cents worth. Thank you. Any other question is Josephine? No, no other questions. So is I it Tawere around? Yes, Tawere is online. Um, okay. Okay. Let me just uh, check off, then I can leave you. Let me hand over to Dr. Tawere to thank GSK for sponsoring this uh, webinar, and I'd like to thank also our parts advocate Govile. And thank all the panelists, and thank all the parts of membership for participating. And um, above all, I'd also like to thank myself. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. How now, Dr. Were? Dr. Were? I think um, you're on? Not quite. Oh. Is he still what? on mute? Dr. Well, Ware? We can close on his behalf. Okay, um, I think um, he's still on mute. Enoch, if you could unmute him, I think. But he's still raising his hand. Mm -hmm. Enoch? By beforehand, thank you, Dr. Lutz, and thank you for all the uh, speakers. I've definitely learned something uh, a lot um of uh, this session and looking forward to many more sessions uh with you um as gsk as well so can you hear me now i've been yes. admitted yes yes dr Were. Yeah. thank you so much the presenters um Prof. <coughs> dr ivan dr bruce dr msalu fantastic presentations we have heard from you as gsk we are just to say that thank you again for the collaboration we also have to just make sure that the attendees know that GSK is also collaborating with other organizations, including WHO, and we are also donating PPE to even locally in Kenya, just to make sure that you understand that we have gone beyond just the training to support the community and healthcare providers in this era of pandemic. Thank you so very much, and have a good evening. Okay, we'll see you on the 19th. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, Bye-bye. Um, yes. Bye.